Stay tuned for the latest message excerpt from josephprince.com. Now let's look at some scriptures. Hebrews chapter 5. The Bible says of home in regards to uh, Melchizedek. I just told you God called him Jesus according to the order of Melchizedek. It's a quotation from the Old Testament. It's the most frequent quotation from the Old Testament in the New. This Melchizedek, we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So this personage of Melchizedek, our high priest, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that he appeared to Abraham. It's one of those things I believe, uh, the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ before he came as a baby, before he came uh, in the New Testament, okay? It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. He met Abraham when Abraham came back from the slaughter of the kings. And Abraham came back with spoils. And Melchizedek met him. And the Bible says to the believers, the Hebrew, Hebrew believers, Jewish believers, we have many things to say about this personage, this person of Melchizedek, but it's hard to explain because you are dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. So I'm going to test you today. Whether, whether you are ready for milk or solid, whether you're ready for solid food or you're settling for milk. So once again, don't forget, my message today is really for people who have gone beyond milk. The Bible says the truth about Melchizedek is for mature people. So forgive me. The rest of you, you can sleep. <laughs> All right? So are we ready? So let's go to the story itself in uh, Genesis chapter 14. The Bible says, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, and by the way, that's, that's Shalom, completeness. He's a king, his name means king of righteousness, and he's the king of this city called Shalom, which means health, wholeness, peace, well-being. Isn't that great? Jesus ushers you into that city. And he brought out bread and wine. Say bread and wine. What is that? Communion. For you to get bread, bread, you gotta, you gotta pound it, you gotta knead it, you gotta, you know, squeeze it, and then you gotta bake it in the oven. That's the process of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before He can feed us, before He can become our bread of life, He went through the beating, that scourging, so that He could become food for you. Food of life itself, man. I'm talking about life. I'm not talking about your heart beating, boop, 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 boop. All right, that's existence. I'm talking about life. Jesus did not come to give you life, uh, laws and more laws. He came to give you life and life more abundant. You got nothing to do with how much you have, how much money you have, how many cars you drive, and how many uh, uh, palaces or castles you have, okay? I thought I might just say that in England. <laughs> but it's a question of life abundant. That's what Jesus came to give. He's the bread of life. Wine, how do you get wine, by the way? Bread and wine. Wine, all right, you gotta, in those days, they step on it. They gotta crush it. Our Lord Jesus was crushed. His blood came out. You know, we, we did the most wicked thing this side of heaven. We took God's son, the son that God loved. God did not give us an angel, he gave us his son. And we took him and we nailed him on the cross. God gave us Jesus who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, loved children, amen, loved sinners, cleansed the leper, and we took him and we nailed him on the cross. It's as if we are telling God, this is what we think of your son. God, on the other hand, took the cross and made it the greatest demonstration of salvation and redemption for sinful men. We'll never know how much we are loved by God, just like my son, Justin. I have a son, three, three years plus, and uh, he's great, thank you. <laughs> he's really good looking like his dad. <laughs> okay, his mom, he looks more like his mom, thank God. <laughs> but uh, Justin will never know how much I love him. He loves his dad, but how many understand, those of you who have children, even grown children, when they have their own, then they begin to have a glimpse of how much you love them. The vertical love, the descending love is always greater than the ascending love. 
you'll never know how much God loves you. Just take it by faith, He loves you. Amen? So the Bible says he brought bread and wine, pictures of the communion. I can tell you stories in my church. You can go to josephprince.com and see testimonies after testimonies uh, of people that uh, were given a, a terrible uh, prognosis of their medical condition and they took communion like medicine every day. Numer numerous testimonies, you know, like they take medicine uh, three times a day, they'll take communion three times a day. You don't need a priest. Jesus is your high priest. Amen. And you take it by faith. The Bible says, for this reason, not discerning the Lord's body, not understanding the Lord's body was broken for our, our healing. For this reason, singular, not reasons. All right. For this reason, many are weak, sick, and sleep. They die before their time in the church. I kind of wish it didn't say many in the church, but it says many. For one reason, why many believers are weak, it's a process, weak, sick, and they die prematurely is because they are not discerning the Lord's body. They take the Lord's communion, right? Like, for example, some believe that, you know, in transubstantiation, they are extreme, and some just take it as completely symbolic. But when you take the Lord's body, discern His body was broken, that your body might be put back together. If you need to take it by medicine, take it. Take it as often as you can. Amen. And if, that, if, you, dis, if you discern the Lord's body, instead of weak, you become strong, Instead of sick, you become healthier. Instead of dying prematurely, you'll live long. Yeah. And I know things about people who take communion in that way, they get younger and younger and younger. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. They belie their age. They are under the blessing of Abraham. Yeah. So that's the first thing that happens. Melchizedek brought to Abraham after the battle that Abraham went through. Abraham was obviously tired all right, with his men, and Abraham met this personage. This amazing man, his first appearance, Melchizedek, which we be I believe is the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. He brought bread and wine, which is communion. And he was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Friend, the Melchizedek priesthood is not like the Levitical priesthood later on under law. Levitical priesthood blesses you when you obey but it curses you when you disobey. There is a mixture of blessing and a curse. But you notice Melchizedek's first word is, blessed be Abraham, blessed be John, blessed be Mary, blessed be Robert, Harlot, whatever your name is, blessed are you. Because Jesus Christ today is not a high priest after the order of Levi. He's the order of Melchizedek. There's no blessing and curse, only blessing, blessing, and more blessings. He blesses men and he blesses God. Hallelujah. Blessed be God most high. He brought communion. You ask me today, oh, Pastor Prince, if everything is done in our worship, is there anything that we bring to God? Well, Abraham gave us something here. And here is where some of you can go to sleep. All right? Because it's not for everybody. I said, this teaching is not for everybody. Abraham gave him a tithe of all. This was before the law, y'all. This was 450 years before the law was given on Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments were not yet given. No one put a gun on, on, to, to uh, Abraham's head and said, give, five. He didn't have to. Obviously, he had a revelation. And the word tithe here in Hebrew, here's where the Hebrew comes in, all right, means maser. Say maser. You see, you have the British accent. You know? <laughs> Maser is spelled, by the way, the uh, Hebrew is read from right to left. This Maser, Mem, Ein, Shin, Resh. Maser, reading from right to left. You see the, the first letter there makes it a noun. Okay? Now, the last three letters, if you remove the noun, all right, you have the word Aser. Aser, the last three letters. Aser means rich. The rich is in the tithe. Come on, people, it's a revelation. It is, it's not for everybody. We said just now, I established the fact that this is strong meat. The problem is that pastors and, and, and people are trying to teach tithing to baby Christians, and many of times they don't fully understand, and, and, and they feel like you're trying to get their money or whatever. No, listen, this is a giving church. I'm not preaching this because I, 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 I think that you all need it. I'm preaching this because you are mature. This excerpt is brought to you by josephprince.com. 
To get the full message, visit josephprince.com. The Bible was written by, by tax collectors, by fishermen, by shepherds and all that. And it can be understood also by people who are simple people like me and you. Both Ananias and Sapphira were not believers. Every time it mentions a believer, it says a certain disciple. Every time it talks about unbelievers, a certain man or woman. But Pastor Prince, they, they were in church. They were among the people there. Yeah, just like there are people who are not believers with us all the time. For that matter, in every church around the world, their intent was to deceive God's people. So actually, this judgment is very consoling for me because it tells me God protects His own. People tell you things like, what about Paul? Paul suffered, what about Paul? And as long as you entertain thoughts like this without resolving them, it will affect your faith. The thing is this, church, come on. What you believe is so important. So if somebody sows seeds of doubt, like, well, what about Paul's suffering? So I want to address Paul's suffering because, uh, you know, it always keeps coming up. Paul had a choice. But Pastor Prince, don't you know history? It tells us under Emperor Nero, Paul was beheaded. Yeah, don't you know your Bible? It says that before he was beheaded, it says, Paul said, I have kept the faith. I have finished the course. I have run the race. He finished whatever God set him to do. People have a negative idea about chastisement. When actually the word here in the Greek, Old Testament is in Hebrew, New Testament is in Greek. The Greek word for chastisement is paideo which means child train. So throughout this entire chapter, when God talks about child train, all right, or, 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 or chastening, He's talking about paideo, child train. Amen, training your child. I believe the primary way God disciplines is the Word. If you have the Word, God may not discipline any, any other way. One of the ways God chastens us is through circumstances. Again, I repeat, not disease, not sickness, not disasters, not loss of a loved one. Discipline does not give you righteousness. Discipline brings out the fruit of your right standing with God. 